Thanks, Helen. So morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, as Helen mentioned, my colleague Brian was due to um, join me today, but unfortunately was unable to, which means that you have the pleasure of listening to me, I guess, for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so specifically today, I want to kind of talk a little bit about our mental health support team and share a little bit about how that's set up but also focus specifically on a transition package that we've developed for year six pupils in Blackburn with Darwin over the past two and a half years. So as part of kind of my role, I work specifically in the secondary school team in Blackburn with Darwin. But within our first year, um, we were specifically commissioned to also work with year six pupils until then the year after, which I'll go into shortly, where our primary school mental health support team came into post. So I'm aware that most people here today are part of a mental health support team. I kind of know where we started and kind of what it's all about. So I'm not really going to spend too long focusing on, on this slide in terms of thinking about where have mental health support teams come from. But basically, we know that it's, it's a national program. And the idea is that the majority of schools or a large po population of schools will have access to a mental health support team. And so within East Lancashire, as Helen said, we've currently got um, eight teams up and running. And in my head, I'm thinking, hey, I'm counting now, yeah. And we're due to get um, another two technically next year as well. Um, so we cover a large area, not just including Blackburn with Darwin, but also Burnley and Pendle and Highburn and Ribble Valley. So as we're aware, the functions of the MHST are to provide direct support to children and young people, um, and also parents as well, in the form of evidence-based interventions, um, to children and young people with mild to moderate mental health issues, we want to support designated senior mental health leads in education settings to introduce and or develop their whole school or college approach to mental health and well-being. And we also provide advice to staff in education settings and leads to external specialist services to help children and young people get the right support and stay in education. And so that can be through consultation or through um, development of training packages. And so an example of that is that we work closely with the school nurses in the local area. And over the last 12 months, one of our mental health practitioners um, has developed a monthly CPD package, which is delivered by two mental health practitioners to our local school nurse team, which focus specifically on different mental health difficulties to support them in terms of their knowledge and skill base. So our mental health support team, that, that we work in. So obviously Brian is our clinical team manager and then we're technically split into kind of these, these two arms. So you've got the primary mental health support team and the secondary mental health support team. I'm part of the secondary. You'll see my name up there. Um, and the way that we work in the secondary is that our schools are equally split across the two arms of the team. And we then have, for example, so I have nine secondary schools that I work with. Um, I have two mental health practitioners who one has five, one has four. And then our education mental health practitioners work in two of those schools or one of them might work in three, with those being the smaller schools. And in the primary mental health support team, although you'll see on the screen that the kind of flow chart or arrow map is similar, is presented similar to the secondary team, they work a little bit different in that they have a large amount of primary schools that they work with. And therefore they're, they're split up into kind of the SIG group. So they have about five or six primary schools in each SIG group. And so they're responsible for kind of the consultation and the functions of the MHST within those specific SIGs. We are, um, as, as Helen mentioned, part of LCAS, which is the East Lancashire Child and Adolescent Camp Service. And so one of kind of the real benefits for our MHST having that service or being part of that service is that actually we're able to step children and young people up into a different level of care if needed but also we can get them transitioned into the mental health support team. And so, for example, if a young person in our team requires psychiatric support for medication or um, an ADHD assessment or um, is kind of displaying some higher risk taking behaviours than, than we're equipped to manage with, we can smoothly transition them into our kind of CAMS, core CAMS team. And so not only have we got that transition, which is great, but also there's an element of that, which means because we're part of the same service technically, the time 
that a young person is with us is their time in that whole service. And so they don't necessarily have to wait longer because they're being transitioned into another team. We work really closely with the local children's psychology service as well. And again, we can kind of almost transition and transfer children and young people through service if it's appropriate, which is one of the things that is, we find really helpful. We meet with them regularly. So with the children's psychology service and also with the core camps team, we meet with them weekly to kind of discuss any referrals that we've had in and think about which one of the three might be the best to support. Um, not every referral that is, but ones where kind of we're saying we're not sure actually what we can offer. Is there something else that you guys could do instead? In terms of kind of the locality information, so the demographic information for Blackburn with Darwin, you'll be able to see it, I guess, kind of, kind of on your screens, but actually some of the key messages, all the things from this that I think are quite important or significant for us is that actually um, in thinking about kind of deprivation in terms of the index of multiple deprivation from the local government it indicates that some areas of Blackburn are in the top 10 most deprived in England, but also we have a higher population of BAME residents. And so actually we're quite aware of the, um, I guess, stigmas related to mental health that we might find within kind of South Asian populations and how we need to work as a team to support that, but also thinking about kind of those IAP principles, specifically around accessibility um, and awareness and how we can work to ensure that children who are part of a deprived area can access our service in the same way that any other child can. And I guess that's one of the great things that I also think about mental health support teams is that being based in schools, it means that families don't necessarily need to travel out of their ordinary so if somebody can't afford to get to um, a health centre or a GP centre and um, we know that their child is likely to be in school so we can kind of do, you know work with them then. We do also offer online virtual services as well for families that can access that or if that's their preference or if they're unable to kind of attend an, an appointment in a different service as well. And so the schools that the secondary team focus on. So we've got 17 secondary schools. Um, we've got 52 primary schools in terms of kind of the Blackburn and Darwin local area. And five of our schools are specifically for SCND students. That does include a PRU as well. And on top of that, we have got um, several faith schools as well. So I specifically work with two Islamic same gender faith schools. And one of the things that I guess we kind of feel really passionately about across the primary and secondary team is the idea of that transition between schools. So that move from year six into year seven. And I guess what we do know is that it can be a significant experience for some young people. You know, not everybody finds transitions difficult, but actually it can contribute to the development of some mental health difficulties. So anecdotal, anecdotally, I think is how you say it. But anecdotally, some of the young people that I've worked with, for example, who I see who are experiencing um, symptoms of generalised anxiety disorder, kind of one of their main significant incidents is that transition to school. So we know that if transitions aren't necessarily done right, or if there's a transition project, kind of that's, that's happening for that young person, it can in some instances lead to mental health difficulties. We know that transition projects and successful transitions promote well-being, higher self-esteem, but also it kind of normalises and validates that young person's experience if there are other people in their peer group who are experiencing that same thing. But also in some ways by doing something with them, which enables them to be able to problem solve or, you know, tolerate some level of uncertainty, we're helping them to develop skills to navigate future transitions or change. So these are transferable skills that we, we're hoping that young people can apply, not just for that transition from year six to year seven, but at other times in life where there might be changes or there might be uncertainty as well. And so in terms of year one and our transition offer, so year one was 2020 and it was our MHST training year. And so for a bit of context with that, we had just the secondary team at that time. 
there was me and Brian. Brian was a senior with me at that time. And we had our mental health practitioners and our education mental health practitioners. And all of those staff members were on training. Um, so we had our EMHPs doing their EMHP training and we had mental health practitioners doing CBT training. And so at that time, there was Brian and I that were um, CBT therapists and clinical supervisors. And so the clinical capacity was significantly reduced as it is across most MHSTs in their training year. But actually, we were due to kind of go live in our schools in terms of accepting referrals from schools in April. And then obviously in March, we kind of went into lockdown due to COVID-19, which led to restrictions on our service. We're part of a hospital trust, so we have to follow hospital guidelines when it comes to COVID measures. Um, but also it meant that we couldn't kind of be in schools when we wanted to. And it also meant that transition projects in schools were either not happening, were delayed or were kind of changed in some way. And so for us, it felt really important to respond to thinking about how can we support young people at this period of time during this massive kind of global uncertainty, but also specifically with their transition. And there's a recognition that when you're in new service, kind of people don't always um, understand, I guess, kind of your your remit or understand kind of in terms of the young people or the, the presentations that you might work with and so we were conscious that we might kind of all of a sudden get a really kind of big influx of referrals from from other services as well as skills so like EPs or children's psychology and skill nurses and so what we did was we collaborated with local services to create a referral pathway which looked at different support options and so that referral pathway was done in conjunction with kind of a, our local education services, school nurses, ed sags, but also it was run through our engagement um, meeting, which includes our CCG and also um, other people from kind of a participation perspective. So we had Health Watch represented and we also had um, parents in partnership. The idea behind the referral pathway was that it kind of offered the idea for consultation for from us as a staff team to education teams and other professionals. And we also then could kind of make a decision about actually do they need some psychoeducation resources? Is it that we want to think about doing an assessment? Is there going to be one to one offered? And you know, what does that look like? So one of the things that we actually developed was a self help workbook. Um, and that was evidence-based in terms of psychoeducation for anxiety, psychoeducation for low mood, looking at the low intensity interventions that the EMHPs um, are taught in that training year and currently work with. So thinking about some worry management, but also looking at behavioral activation as it kind of feels important, I guess, to, to acknowledge that change doesn't always just create anxiety and worry, it can lead to low mood as well in terms of some of those friendships changing or those key relationships with adults around that young person in school kind of being lost. And so the workbook was developed and we ran that through our participation members. At the time, we had a small group of young people um, and we also had our parent in partnership group. And it felt really important to kind of get their take on that. It's been a long, long, long time since I was in primary school or since I've done some sort of school transition. And so what it was for me back in the day is, is probably not the same as it is for young people now. And I won't go on a massive rant about social media and, and all the other things that our young people have to contend with currently. So in year two, um, we had our primary school team and I've got some um, staff members who are, who are in the workshop today from that team who are here um, and they were an active team but also similar to us they had a large proportion of staff in, in training um, the referral pathway that we developed remained active to ensure that I guess everybody was accessing the right service at the right time and our primary school team took the lead on transition. So as part of that, they reviewed the workbook and um, again, ran that through some of the feedback that we'd had from young people um, and parents and carers that had used it. They um, offered interactive assemblies, workshops and one-to-one -one assessment and intervention. And they also offered the consultation previously. 
and going back to the workbook in year one that was sent out to all the primary schools in, in the local area. And as a secondary team, we would then use that for any year sevens that were schools were kind of worried about our highlights was in September. We asked them if they'd use the workbook and would share that if we thought that they didn't need to come into a mental health service, but actually some psychoeducation might be helpful. The general anxiety workshops were offered in year seven to catch, I guess, for want of a better word, young people in need. So what we found was that some year set, some of our year sevens although they'd engaged with kind of the interactive assemblies in the workbook, actually had, had struggled kind of three months in. And so we put on workshops to kind of support them, um, psychoeducation based with some elements of worry management in there. There was also some individual work which happened in the primary school team for, for year six pupils that continued over summer and those young people were then transitioned into secondary teams. So one of the really helpful things about this is that our six tend to have all our feeder schools for secondary schools in them as well. So it's easy for us to kind of link up in, across the whole team, if that makes sense. So in terms of my secondary schools that I cover, I can link up with the key staff in the primary school team who those primary schools are a part of their, their SIG. And then we go into year three in the transition offer. And so there was an earlier start time for transition work. And I guess in a bit, I'm gonna summarize or kind of say like what my top tips are really for how I found this or how I think this has worked so well or why I think kind of this is working well for us. But one of them is definitely like starting earlier. Um, so kind of like year one, it was last minute dash to get this workbook and pathway and developed and kind of what we recognize is actually, if you just focus on like the last month in school, transition doesn't just start then, it starts really kind of a lot earlier than that. And we know that the two main things that year six pupils tend to focus on is exams prior to secondary school, and also then that, the transition to secondary school. So there's a recognition that we need to start earlier. We had an increase in the uptake of interactive assemblies and workshops. There was also the continuation of previous work completed so thinking specifically about kind of that assessment, the one-to-one, -one, you know, the consultation, there was an active inclusion of secondary schools. And so what we found was that some of our secondary schools um, were kind of attending the interactive assemblies and workshops. So we had key staff members that were that were representing schools that were that were kind of turning up there, um, which was really great for us in terms of their involvement in kind of, I guess, some of the work that we're doing and how perhaps that some of the language that we use or some of those key skills that we shared can then almost transition with that young person into that school because there's got a key staff member who's aware of, of the work we've done. But also there were resources that were developed to support schools in delivering transition projects. So thinking about schools taking this on for their whole school and college approach. And again, that feels really important for not only that shared language, but actually thinking about the functions of the MHST and how we can support education services and schools in developing their whole school approach. But also, I think one of the really good things about that for me is that actually it then almost gives us opportunity as mental health professionals to develop something else or work in a different area if school kind of have taken ownership of that or are doing that piece of work. We offer them supervision as such around that or time for consultation. So if they wanted to check in with us around um, part of the transition project or something had popped up in one of those sessions, they can contact a staff member within the team and kind of discuss that through, you know, like troubleshoot it um, and kind of share that good practice really. And so this is just, a, I guess, a little snap it, snap it, snip it about um, one of the things that's happened this year. Um, so we've done kind of like a live stream assembly. And as, as part of that, we've done five sessions overall, which has included 38 year six classes. So that's approximately 1,160 pupils. And we've also had six secondary schools as part who have, have formed part of that. And one of the really helpful things is that we've actually had um, pupils from those schools attend that as well so through kind of that participation element some of our um, young people that we've worked with are also like our schools have recruited some young people to uh, attend that so there's been a bit of a Q&A where year six pupils have been able to speak to current year sevens or year eight pupils about transition what the school was like and get some of those questions answered 
So 75% of our year sixes who participated were worried about the transition from year six to year seven. And you know, there are some figures on here and you can see that actually after the um, live stream, their level of worries dropped quite significantly to 48%. 27% of children who were very worried reduced to 11% and 48% of children who were a little worried reduced to 37%. So one of the, the key things, I guess, that kind of we're all about and as MHSTs, we have to report quarterly and, and even more frequently in terms of our outcomes. But we're really keen in our team about kind of getting feedback from young people, parents, carers and teachers that we work with, but also how do we know that what we're doing is working and how can we track those outcomes all the time? And so at the moment, what we're finding is that actually what we're getting is quite qualitative data. So you'll see some quotes from some young people and from some of the education teams that we've worked with on screen. Um, and what we want to think about is look at how can we get some more quantitative data um, and what that might look like. And so I guess what we can see at the moment is that if we're doing workshops or group work or individual work, we'll be using our typical suite of, of ROMs and outcome measures that we use anyway. So we'll be using like our RCADs, our SDQ and a couple of practitioner measures and we'll be able to and even and like goal based outcomes and kind of track those changes over time. Um, but what we haven't got at the moment is a way of getting that qualitative, sorry, quantitative data for our kind of live streams as such, our, our, our place that we can hold that. But one of the really good things that we, we have um, using IACTUS in our service is it's changed the way that we're able to record our whole school and college approach work. And so one of the main things that I get asked in my lecturing role on the EMHP course by service leads and others is how do you tend to record that or how does that work for you? Um, and so IAPTUS has typically been very good when it comes to recording individual work, group work, um, kind of if you're doing any two plus one. And what we did in our service was we set up like a dummy patient where we use that to record all our consultation. But actually it was then difficult to really pull that data apart and um, kind of figure out what school. So if we've got one school that's accessing whole school and the college approach more than another school, or if we've got, you know, and, and comparing that to the already robust and kind of in detail data we've got about referrals and outcome measures from individual and group work. And so the diary function on access was is just amazing and was like one of those things when it came along we're like this is just what we need and so the diary function on apps is you can select kind of what work it is that you're doing so whether it's like consultation assembly you can select which specific school it's for you can put a bit of a blurb about what you've done and so actually we've now got a way of kind of pulling that data off and, and sharing it kind of with NHSE which will then encapsulate the whole school and college approach work that we're doing. And in, in terms of next steps, so I guess before we kind of discuss that, I guess I wanted to think about my three top tips or things that I think are really important. And so from year one, the thing that I think we learned the most was that participation is really key. And so as an IAP service, we're really kind of fall back on our principles, but also thinking about it's a long time, like I said before, since most of us have done a transition in, in a, from primary school to secondary school. But also, how do we know what young people want if we don't ask them? And how do we know what works if we're not asking them that either? So, you know, we're really keen in terms of promoting participation through each stage of our transition project and gathering that information so we can improve it. We want to make it more robust. The learning from year two was start early. So if you think you're early enough, maybe kind of start three weeks earlier than that or a month earlier than that so you know we kind of I think our workbook went out in July I think last year our transition workshops and things started in June this year it's been like April May time so actually we kind of recognize that we need to start earlier um, and kind of get those conversations going and what we've figured out is that there are, there are key times, as there are in all schools, where some of these conversations might feel a bit more difficult for example when you've got exams on so we've kind of worked with the schools to have these conversations before that time. So we got things booked in, knowing that we're probably going to have trouble or less communication, understandably, during those times when our schools are really busy. 
Um, but we've already got things booked in that we know that we, we're kind of looking forward to. And then from year three, I guess our learning here really is, is including key people in the transition package. So specifically including kind of key people in that school to support them taking on that transition package and thinking about that whole school and college approach, because they're the people that, that, that young people are going to be seeing more regularly than they will do us when we just pop up to do a workshop or kind of maybe give them six to eight sessions of low intensity CBT. But also, I guess, included in that is thinking about um, parents and carers and actually how are we involving them in, in this transition package. And so we invite them along to our assemblies. You know, there's going to be, we already do in the secondary team kind of parent workshops and webinars and things like that. And so in the primary school, that's going to be one of the things that they kind of are working on as well. I think it's really important for everybody around that young person to have the shared language to support them through the transition and also know kind of what we're talking about so if a young person comes home and says oh you know uncle this is what I've done today we want them to be able to kind of really engage with that and support us with that too so next steps and things that are key things I guess for us that we feel like we're not doing so great on is that year 11 transition and our key stage transition from one to two I think year 11s kind of tend to get missed in some ways are all forgotten about with our focus being so much on, on year sixes and thinking about that early intervention idea for mental health support teams. But actually what we are doing is next Monday as a team, we've got a team away day where we're going to be spending a big chunk of our time developing and thinking about what can these transition packages look like for year 11 and also key stage one to two. And then we're going to kind of be taking that back to our participation group. So we have a young person's one and we have um, like a parent support group and they're kind of really keen on getting involved with us in participation as well. But also thinking about the feedback we've had of what's worked well, what's not worked so well, but also what our schools are saying. Um, and then another thing for us is that data collection. And so we want to be able to track over time the success rate for any work that we do and, and I guess one of the, the great things that we've got with having the primary schools and the secondary schools is that we almost cover that young person from kind of their first day in, in primary up un, until they leave us and um, some of our schools do have a sixth form attached as well and at the moment we're not actively working with them but we are piloting um, in one of our schools in one of my secondary schools a, a dropping kind of model to support with some of the needs that have arisen for our year 12 students but actually what we want to do is be able to really get into our data pull it apart and see what's working well for us and maybe what we, what we need to change and, and what we need to think about but also look at a way that we can perhaps get some more of that quantitative data whether there's a ROM that we can use that we can then link up um, on iAccess but I guess that's for us to figure out at some point. You're going to get a copy of um, these slides anyway, but on here is my email address and Brian's email address if you wanted to chat with us about anything or ask us about anything. Um, we share our Instagram and Twitter with the wider Wellcast service. There's us that pop up on there and there's loads of other, I guess, bits and pieces as well. Um, there are going to be some links or things that get posted in chat. Um, and one of them, I think, is going to be a link to our newsletter. So we send out a newsletter, I think it's monthly now, um, and it's usually in PDF format, but contains some elements of like psychoeducational tips, but a bit of update on the team, kind of what we've been up to. And there's usually a page where there might be pictures or symbols that you click on that will send um, parents, carers, young people and education staff and other services to other services in the local area. So we're trying to raise awareness of what's out there in our local area as well. But if you're interested in the newsletter, please do let me know because I can get you added to our distribution list. Um, and that's everything from me. So I'm going to stop presenting now.